a role for a hematologist or a hematology laboratory in a COVID-19 infection. Uh, of course, a small introduction, COVID-19 uh, stands for the coronavirus disease uh, discovered in 2019. Uh, it's an RNA a virus from animals. Uh, <clears throat> predominant mode is airborne and spread can be through contact, contaminated surfaces or sometimes fecal roots. Uh, people usually present uh, with acute febrile illness, which will be fever, dry cough, fatigue and dyspnea. Uh, progression can, to, can lead to involvement of all organs. Median age of uh, across uh, uh, age and sex is uh, 47, I mean, across sex is 47 years. Um, median age of severe cases are 63 years and uh, the severity is uh, uh, somehow related to age, age people as well as people who have other comorbidities. <clears throat> there is, of course, no vertical transmission to fetus. And as far as blood transmission, which is also my area, uh, there is no transfer, uh, transmission transmitted infection. Uh, known so far. Ultimately, many of these people, when they progress, they progress into a frank DIC, uh, leading to almost 2% mortality. Uh, majority actually have only mild disease. So when you have an acute febrile illness and a hematology laboratory in the context of uh, COVID-19, what can a hematology laboratory offer? White cell counts, which is very important for acute febrile illness, which can be obtained from cell counters. ESR, a surrogate marker is CRP. There are many cell counters now which come with these markers. Platelet counts from cell counters. And of course, there are coagulation defects that have been described in patients with COVID. Uh, and of course, that can be obtained from coagulometers which are existing in many hematology laboratories. Interestingly, the coagulation defects start with uh, a hypercoagulable state in these patients. Uh, there is a good data that has come from Singapore General Hospital um, and that is on clot waveform analysis. Uh, done on patients who had COVID, and they described these changes to be reflecting a hypercoagulable state in the plasma when they were doing PT and APTT. Of course, a hypercoagulable state, if it uh, becomes severe and worsens, it goes on to a frank DIC, and as markers of DIC, the prothrombin time is increased, there can be decrease in fibrinogen, and of course, the D-dimer is very highly elevated. So it looks like there is a lot of thrombin generation that is happening in these patients. But that is all for coagulation defect. Let's go on to the cell counters and acute febrile illness. Of course, always white cell counts are very important in acute febrile illness. We can get neutrophilia, like in bacterial infection, lymphocytosis, which can happen in viral infection, monocytosis, which can happen in chronic infections, neutropenia, which can happen in acute uh, bacterial infection, like sepsis. Eosinopenia can be a marker of any good infection, um, severe infection. Uh, for, uh, only thing is you need to keep a different reference range which may be applicable to your population. In CMC, our reference range for eosinophils are 200 to 600 instead of 40 to 440 that has been described in most of the literature. Most of the cell counters, uh, the SI unit is 10 raised to the power of 9 per liter. Uh, many of us in laboratory prefer, uh, uh, you know, thousands uh, per microliters, which is same as 1000 per cubic millimeter. And of course, lymphocytopenia is also very common in many viral illnesses, especially the community acquired uh, respiratory viruses. We know that uh, a flagging generally comes out from abnormal patterns. When this uh, cell counter suspects that there's an abnormal population present in an abnormal location, they actually can give a flag for a blast, which can be a myeloblast or a lymphoblast. But we also realize that many systemic diseases process bring about changes in white cells, red cells, and platelets, which are the regular white cells, neutrophils, regular eosinophils, regular lymphocytes. They bring about changes in these cells, and these changes are reflected in its output, but there is no flag. However, these, reflect, these changes are uh, reflected as changes, which is, a, which is actually a, uh, reflected as a measure of the cell. The measure of the cell is also called the cell population data, and this is an example of a cell population data, which was obtained on 3,000 healthy blood donors. Uh, which tell you that what is an average size of a neutrophil um, and the distribution of the neutrophil, an average size of a lymphocyte, average size of a monocyte and its distribution, the average other characteristic of a neutrophil like the internal structure, which is conductivity, the granularity of the neutrophil, the average. Yeah. So this is the reflection of what could be there in a normal human being. Uh, and many uh, other centers have also developed cell population data in most of the cell counters, uh, like um, uh, Beckman-Coulter, Mindray, 
um, so the Sysmex as well as Horiba. And um, many of them have compared and that's fairly comparable. So this cell population data, are they useful in acute febrile illness? Yes. For example, if you look at this 17-year-old male with viral fever, you can see that the white cell counts have gone up and you can see that there is an abnormal population, a pattern that you can see. Uh, so this is the patient and that's a normal on your um, right hand side. What you can see is the a normal uh, display on a mind ray cell counter. And you can see that there is a huge population on the getting to hitting the roof of the cube. And those are the abnormal lymphocytes that you see in viral infection. So this is a patient who has got lymphocytosis with abnormal uh, uh, viral lymphocytes. And uh, so this is an example of, uh, and this can be objectively measured as high fluorescent cell percentage. Uh, you can see that, you know, the cell count is also flagged abnormal lymphoblast, atypical lymphocytes, and also mentioned lymphocytosis. For example, there's another patient who had sepsis. Uh, you can see that the neutrophil population when compared to a normal uh, display, you can see the neutrophils have, have got very high fluorescence along the x-axis, sorry, the y-axis. And that's mainly because of the uh, changes that happen to the neutrophil during acute febrile, I mean, acute bacterial infection, especially sepsis. So what is a role for a cell counter in COVID? What is already known about COVID from data that has come from China and also from other centers is that uh, white cell counts are important. Many people have reflected leukopenia, but that's not that common. So I don't agree with leukopenia as a marker for COVID. But uh, neutrophilia can be there, but sometimes it can be relative neutrophilia. Eosinopenia is definitely, but eosinopenia is a non-specific marker because a lot of infections are associated with eosinopenia. But what is characteristically mentioned is that patients present with lymphocytopenia. Those people, once they become symptomatic, one of the earliest signs is lymphocytopenia. The reference range for lymphocytes can be 1.4 to 1,400 to 4,800 per cubic millimeter. Some people can put the reference range as uh, 1,000 to 4,000 per cubic millimeter. But when it's children population, obviously, you're not starting at one. It can be 3,000 to 9,000 per cubic millimeter. So anything that's less than 1,000 uh, 1, or 1 into 10 raised to the power of 9 per liter can be defined as lymphocytopenia. But we also notice that the cell counters do also give a percentage. And we as laboratory hematologists also do a differential count on the slide and we say that the lymphocyte percentage. So the reference range for percentage of lymphocyte is 20 to 40 percent in a differential count. So what should be considered as lymphocyte opinion? Is it the absolute lymphocyte count, which we are not usually used to, or it should be percentage which we are commonly used to? So do we require this fancy uh, high-end fantastic cell counters to identify these simple changes? So lymphocytopenia can be reflected by any cell counter because that's a work of a cell counter. However, when we are using cell counters of this high-end type, we all also like to look at cell population data. So yes, uh, fortunately, Mindray had the uh, consultancy of Dr. Raymond Simon, who is thus indulged in a lot of cell population data of studies. And in his presentation, which he made a few weeks back, he did mention that one of the cell population data that has caught his uh, attention is monocyte EZ on a, on a um, BC 6800 cell counter, uh, which may be an indirect relationship to the monocyte size. As you know, monocyte EZ is a forward scatter on a monocyte that is shrinking as it's being measured. So, you know, the processing in the uh, mind cell counter is that the cells are, um, they put a pore into the cell and they, uh, and they allow the dye to get in by the, side, by the time the cell starts shrinking, but the analysis is done before it completely shrinks. So it can be assumed to be significant as the processing rate or transit time in a BC6800 plus is faster than usual of the usually other, other cell counters. So maybe it's probably reflecting the uh, real-time uh, me measurement of the monocyte size. However, there is no scattergram morphology that we saw in a patient with dengue that I showed you earlier, where there's a lymphocyte uh, pattern that uh, is very characteristic a morphology on a dengue infection. So lymphocytopenia, uh, what are the other values that could be picked up on a cell counter? Maybe not uh, indication of a COVID infection uh, because lymphocytopenia is not that uncommon in other viral infection, especially the commonly community transmitted um, uh, 
respiratory illnesses that happen during certain season. So they also present with lymphocytopenia. Uh, so it's not a marker of COVID illness or diagnostic of COVID illness, uh, but it can be used to monitor uh, along with other markers which can indicate progression of this uh, condition or prognosis which can be indicated towards a poor prognosis. So absolute lymphocyte count, if they decrease, it is bad for the uh, patient. And the cutoff is put as 0.63 into 10 raised to the power of 9 per liter. Absolute neutrophil, uh, neutrophils increase and they also come out with a lot of uh, cell population data changes, which can also happen in other conditions. Uh, so in severe cases, the neutrophilia can be more than 7,850 or 7.85 into 10 to the power of 9 per liter. And a bad outcome is associated with much higher neutrophil, that's 9.27 into 10 raised to the power of 9 per liter. Of course, what is being talked about is the NLR, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. So it's going to be very easy because neutrophils are increasing and lymphocytes are decreasing. So if a neutrophil is 3.13 times the lymphocyte in the blood, uh, it indicates that the, the, the person needs uh, extra attention. Of course, uh, platelet thrombocytopenia is only seen in very severe cases, otherwise not normally seen. Like when we always look at dengue, we think platelets will drop. Here, we don't have to think that way. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, like most of the other conditions, uh, red cell distribution with standard deviation is also found to increase in severe cases. So all this can be picked up on a cell counter. Uh, so the issue is whether should we go for absolute lymphocyte count or should we look at percentage? So here I have got two patients who have been positive for uh, COVID illness. They were only symptomatic. They were not severe. Here you can see that their white cell count is high. Neutrophilia is there. The lymphocyte uh, is definitely 3.13 times lower than neutrophils. But if you look at the absolute lymphocyte count of one and less than one, none of these patients will be called as lymphocytopenia. But if you look at their percentage of 20 and less, both these people can, can be called as lymphocytopenia. Even the percentage will pick you, uh, give you a, a NLR of 3.13 or more. So you can see that probably percentage may be better because uh, there's a lot of fluctuation of white cell count, which may not give you a lymphocyte, uh, absolute lymphocyte count of less than one, even in patients with severe uh, COVID illness. So I think a percentage of less than 20% may be more reliable as a marker of lymphocytopenia rather than an absolute lymphocyte count. Uh, so do you require these high-end cell counters to identify these parameters? I think maybe not. Uh, because if you look at a three-part cell counters, there's an output from a three-part cell counters. All of you who work in um, uh, good laboratories are used to three-part cell counters. Those who work in remote parts of the country are also used to three-part cell counters. You can see that if you look at it carefully, the WBC histogram is divided into three parts. We are only interested in the, the first part and the third part. The third part is the neutrophil and the first part is the lymphocyte. And every three-part cell counter will give you a lymphocyte in percentage or an absolute count. And as I said, we are interested in percentage. So if a person presents with febrile illness um, and if you are doing a cell count, uh, maybe uh, those who have lymphocytopenia where the percentage of lymphocyte less than 20% can be selected for testing. So this was something that was proposed in our hospital when the testing was not happening uh, to identify patients uh, who have got febrile illness. Maybe those with long lymphocytopenia should be uh, sent for testing. So this was, but now that testing has happened rapidly, we don't probably require a screening tool like this, but I would still trust a screening tool like this. So uh, coming back to uh, the fact that uh, uh, there is worsening of condition uh, with absolute lymphocyte count decreasing, increase in absolute uh, neutrophils. Um, then uh, you have the uh, uh, NLR and platelet counts also picked up on a three-part cell counter and a RDWSD, which can also be identified on three-part cell counter. So three-part cell counters can right now provide all that data which is required or which has been indicated as uh, changing in patients who develop COVID infection. So what is the development that is uh, required? Because a lot of people, especially in India, who are cytomorphom uh, cyt chemocytomorphometrists uh, like Anil, who is also going to speak, and of course, uh, Dr. Sujay, uh, his lab with uh, Anand Vikas being there, I hope he also identifies some scattergram morphology. Uh, yes, so I think India may come out with uh, some cell, cell population data or scattergram morphology, which may be better than what has been coming out from the rest of the world. So I now 
a hand over to uh, Anil Handu, but I would wish there was a lot of cytomorphometry to be discussed in COVID infection. But uh, I think uh, he is going to talk about more important aspect about laboratory's approach to a patient who presents with COVID infection. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sukesh, sir. Uh, there have been a lot of questions which are coming on. So before we can uh, invite, sir, would you be okay to answer a couple of the, those questions, sir? Okay. okay. Uh, let uh, me go to the chat box. Yes, sir, we will help you with that. Uh, Varun, can you uh, talk about the questions that have been, been coming? One of the questions, I will read it out to you, sir. Uh, So somebody had asked, sir, so is there a difference between SIC, DIC, and CAC? Yeah, is so uh, on, there yeah. is, um, you know, yeah, obviously when we talk about uh, sepsis-induced coagulopathy, uh, we are generally starting with a, a hypocoagulable state, but uh, there are some DICs which the hypercoagulable state can become very obvious, but, uh, you know, we just wait for the evolution of that to happen. Uh, now that Generally, people will say that hypercoagulable state can be treated, but nobody has uh, taken any, any approach or randomized trial on that particular aspect because nobody wants to use a, uh, you know, convert a person into hypocoagulable state when a DIC is impending. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, eventually the, uh, the pathophysiology uh, of everything uh, turns towards one particular direction and it leads to end organ damage. Sir, there's a question from Dr. Dilna Kerala. Uh, she yes. has two questions. She's asking, is peripheral smear mandatory in all febrile patients in current scenario? Or should we wait for confirmation from of community spread by ICMR? So I think, you know, um, we, we are, uh, when I talked about hematology parameters, we are only talking at numbers. We are not talking about any morphology changes. There are some subtle morphology changes which have been there, like uh, increasing size of a monocyte or a lymphocyte. But... Uh, they are not reflected on regular peripheral red morphology. I think um, um, maybe for research purposes, you can archive a slide, but uh, you, as long as you have a slide review rule in your, uh, in your laboratory, which uh, encompasses uh, most of the abnormalities, you just need to follow that. You don't need to have a special, special slide review rule in case of COVID. So there's one more question. Uh, should we do COVID-19 tests in patients with history? and differential count showing lymphopenia. So as, that's what I said, you know, <clears throat> initially when we were not doing testing, uh, our reason are one of the things to identify uh, a potential uh, patient who presents with uh, fever and uh, probably respiratory symptoms uh, is to look at lymphopenia and probably look at him carefully and send his sample for testing. But now that we are doing testing ourselves, uh, we also realize that lymphocytopenia is not a very specific marker, maybe a sensitive marker, because there are many other community respiratory viral illnesses that happen in, during this particular season, which are associated with lymphocytopenia. But this can be used as a marker of progress and uh, prognosis. So we take one more last question now, and then we can take others. So uh, one of the question is higher inflammatory markers like IL-6 seems to be associated with higher mortality. So is IL-6 yeah. a marker for more severe disease? So, you know, uh, you're uh, coming to almost a macrophage activating syndrome, uh, which is, um, uh, which will be associated with these markers. Uh, yes, severe, um, um, uh, you know, mac uh, they, they obviously we are talking at severe cases here and there has been a uh, component of macrophage activating syndrome because most of their patients, the ferritin levels are very high. It's an acute phase reactant, but uh, uh, we had just written a paper on uh, potential hypothesis on how to reduce the impact of macrophage activating syndrome by a little bit of plasma exchange. But of course, all these will only reflect towards a macrophage activating syndrome. So uh, if you can take one more question. So uh, the yeah. question is that what precaution to be taken by lab personnel handling CBC sample or a smear preparations? Can you say that again? What precaution should be taken by the lab personnel while handling CBC sample and smear preparation? Oh, yeah. So this will be the, you know, um, uh, routine PPE is what is uh, done, which is no, nothing beyond that. 
Only thing is, uh, previously when we do the PP, we will be thinking that there is no problem. But this time, just think that there is something. So just use the routine PP.